my graduates from my school being Forbes. Bag drop. Bag drop. <laughs> a mic drop. Bag drop. Bag drop. All right, guys, welcome back. EYL, we're on a legendary run out here in LA, still out here. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something that you know, we've been looking forward to for a while. It's going to be a special interview. Yeah. So, all my you, trapped in the 90s dudes. That's I grew a fact. up on this. If you follow us, you know how big fans we are of music, plays a big part in everything that we do. Um, specifically, Nas. My, my son's name is Nasir. So, all right, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, if you follow Nas's career, obviously you know the commissioner, Steve Stout. Uh, just a dynamic guy for over probably 30 years, maybe even longer, as far as, you know, a real pioneer in uh, marketing and transitioning the whole landscape as far as, you know, bringing the marketing, advertising dollars, corporate to hip hop culture. He was like the person that actually did that. The, the real bridge. No, it's a fact. You a real plug. Yeah, the, the plug. real plug. Meet the plug for sure. <laughs> United Masters, um, you might have heard of that. Uh, that is his new company that he started, I believe, a couple years ago. Over one million independent artists, where they distribute your music to the platforms, um, and you get to keep your masters. Why the name United Masters? Shout out to the good folks of United Masters, Dave. Yeah. Shout out to our guy Dave. Shout out to Dave. Good dude. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Steve Stout, I can keep going on and on and on. But um, we're going to have an interesting conversation. So first and foremost, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. I'm, I'm happy to be here. And I like the intro, too. The intro is <laughs> kind of hot, kind of fire. You name your son Nasir. That's fantastic. That's yeah. good. That's good stuff. Nah, I'm a huge yeah. Nas fan. Like, yeah. huge, like huge, huge, huge. I'm so. a huge fan of Nas as well, man. I'm actually becoming more and more of a fan. And he just keeps getting better in time. This guy we, we saw you on the golf course gym. in the video. <laughs> yeah, it feels like everybody's playing golf now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a theme of music videos with golf in it. Um, yeah. So let's 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 jump right into this um, conversation. We're gonna talk about a variety of different things. Okay. But first and foremost, I want to talk about. We gonna start it out with United Masters. So a million independent artists, right? Yeah. This is an interesting conversation because shout out to Corday. We just, yeah, we just, I that, I'm really impressed with that guy. Um, we just interviewed him a few days ago. He's smart. He's yeah, smart. yeah, yeah, definitely. He, he's a genius. And he talks his shit too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he brought up a good point. He was like, you know, you could be rushed, you could be independent, you can, but the biggest artists in the world still get played on on radio, still are signed to major labels. Drake, who you name it. So the independent game, in my from my knowledge, has increased 32 percent, I believe, during the pandemic last year. Yeah, but we, like you said. The biggest artists are still on labels. The vast majority of them don't own their masters. So is independent, is it ever going to be a thing where independence becomes the, the top level or yeah. will it always be like a subsidiary? No. It, 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 they, look, um, uh, Corday, he's, he's super smart and um, he's right. I mean, it's easy to say that the biggest artists are now um, are assigned to labels, Uh Primarily because the biggest artists were actually independent and then labels signed them. They chose to go that route. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like they weren't going to be big um, anyway. Like they just decided to take the bag and, and sign with a record company. If you just go back in time, what, what record companies did extremely well, the way they protected their business, if anybody could build a business, if you had this level of monopoly, you couldn't find your fans you couldn't find your audience unless you signed to a record company. The only way for you to find your audience was to get to a record company, they get your video on MTV, they get your song on the radio. Now, artists find their fans before they find a record company. You actually start building your audience before you find a record company. So it never made sense to me when that switched, why you would have to sign to a record company and then give away your master's as a result of that, if, if a record company wants to invest in you because you got a business going, if you have a business going already, you can invest in me, but that doesn't mean you should own my shit. And then like, you, no disrespect to nobody, but like these guys start talking like, well, you're you speaking to record company guys talk. Well, I, I don't believe if I make an investment, you should give me, well, I shouldn't give you my fucking trademarks. I shouldn't give you my IP. Like, I already built an audience. You didn't come in. You didn't find me in my mom's house, man. 
You found me on YouTube and TikTok and I was doing it. So you're going to put money in me and not treat it like a regular investment where you get a good return on your investment? That's cool. You don't need to own my rights. So those are usury terms, Mm -hmm. okay? Those loans are usury terms. If that was a banking business, uh, they would be... uh, it would be illegal, the terms in which they lend their money on. So, you know, this idea that you can't be a big artist without being signed to a record company is only uh, happening because record companies, they, we had NLE Chopper. He came to United Masses. Yeah. We had Little Tecca. He came to United Masses. Yeah, they're big. He, he was big on United Masses. They gave him $10 million. NLE Chopper, right? Yeah, yeah, they gave him $10 million. He's 16 years old. So what does that mean now? Oh, man, NLE Chopper, he signed to a record company. That's the reason why he's big. No, he's actually gone smaller since he's gone to the record company. We had Lil Tecca. They gave him $5 million. He signed a re- I don't want to stop them from getting it back, but I just want to eradicate this idea that they're big because they signed the record companies. No. From your point of view, how, how does that feel, right? We help build this artist. I mean, because one way it's like, yes, we're helping these young men become millionaires and they're getting mm-hmm. money that they've never seen before in their life. Is there a part of you that says, man, I wish they would have stayed a little bit longer so they could see the longevity play? Absolutely. I, I think that um, we, I've seen this time and time again with young entrepreneurs. They're all, they're all entrepreneurs now. Yeah. I mean, if you're an artist, you're an entrepreneur. So let's just stop the artist thing and make it an artist and like you're creative and you're over there. Whether you're a manager or whoever it is that's around you, you need to be treated like an entrepreneur. And when you're an entrepreneur, you make decisions. Are you going to bet on yourself for the long run or are you going to take the short money? And everybody's faced with that decision. I don't care what it is, man. You could buy a piece of property and you could be like, is this thing going to go all the way or are you going to sell it real fast? And I've seen a lot of people sell property real fast and go, shit, if I would have just held this shit for three years, I it would have been triple. Mm-hmm. I didn't get the triple. Um, and that's the same thing with these artists. Do you want to sign with a record company and sign your rights away or do you want to build and build your career? I think Russ is a great artist. Okay. He was independent, went to a record company. Now he's back independent. He's making a gang of money. He's making more money than guys that are signed. Mm-hmm. He's showing you the receipts and he's, and he's spitting the game. Okay. Um, there's an artist on United Masters, Toby Nigui. That's, my, that's yeah, my guy. That's like that. huge, blo- huge, huge supporter of ours. Shout out to Toby. Blowing. Yeah. It don't look like he needs a record company. What does he need a major label to do for him? What, what is he missing? <laughs> what part is missing? Well, I think that Toby is a super talented, one of my favorite artists. Mm-hmm. But um, until, in my opinion, my humble opinion, until we have an artist that's as big as Drake, the fame, right? That's part of it too. Vanity, fame. Well, Drake, I mean, look, man, Drake is a very special talent um, who came up. His first song was Independent, you know, the first song that got everybody uh, um, the working with him and Trey songs. Uh, uh, I want successful. the money. The yeah, 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 right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he got signed off of that. And he, he, Drake would tell you that he's never even met the people at the record company. <laughs> he doesn't even talk to them. <laughs> I'm not even joking. He doesn't even speak to them. Like, I'm not saying they don't do anything. Is he still with a major? Yeah, yeah, he's still with a major. And I feel like he was when, on his last album, and they yeah. just re-signed him. But okay. like, Universal, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Spotify and Apple Music to me specifically is why, you know, is what's blowing Drake. It ain't radio. Well, I wanted to ask you that. It's not. It's not. It's not radio. Well, yeah. no. It, Nori brought up a good point before where he said that he thinks the phone companies are on pace to be the new record labels. Mm-hmm. And um, like in the, in the podcast game, like, you know, Spotify, um, they're buying a podcast. So yeah. like Joe Rogan is exclusively. So do you see that happening where it's like, all right, Drake, $100 million Apple deal, your music exclusive to Apple? Well, they, they did that before. Yeah. Um, that, they did that when, when, you remember when Apple yeah. um, and Spotify and Tidal were coming out, you know, you had to get the Kanye albums exclusively on Tidal, yeah, yeah. and then Drake had it some exclusive. I think Views was exclusive I, I think on the, Apple it was Music. The Drake and Future yeah, album. Yeah, they had, and like they they were they were playing that game because like they were hope, they, the hope was if it's exclusive, then you will sign up to that platform yeah, to yeah. get that plus other stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I think artists' music need to be everywhere. So um, you want to get your, your songs on as many platforms as possible. So I don't think that's the idea that will work. Mm. Um, they've done that before. And it, it, it worked, but not really. It, mm. it was fine. It got, it got titled some love. It got Apple Music some love. But it certainly didn't do the best thing for the artist. I think the artist's music need to be, um, they need to get their music as everywhere and as easily to access as possible. Yeah, well, uh, one of the things that United Master does is partner, and it's very strategic about how you partner. I know you guys have a deal with the NBA. Uh, you did some stuff with TikTok. Yeah. How do you go about finding the companies? Do you guys have your ears? Or is there a team of people that look like this is what's next? This can help boost our brand. How do you guys go about strategic partnerships? Um, well, I've, you know, I've been in the advertising game for many, many years now, and I, I've built a, a great team of people. We represent, you know, AT&T and State Farm and the NBA and Kaiser Permanente. And um, I mean, it's a long list of, of people that we, we do work with. So finding brands to work with us is something that we are very skilled in. And mm -hmm. we have a deep bench of people who know how to do that. So when we say, okay, we want to do a partnership with TikTok or, or ESPN or Disney, um, what have you, or the NBA, it's in our ecosystem already. Like it's one call away. It's not like, a, oh, what are we going to do? How do we get, that's the right idea, but we don't know how to get them on the phone. We have all of them on the phone. Mm -hmm. They're all right there. You know, now partnerships only work when they're shared values, right? If there's something in it that's equally beneficial to you, that's beneficial to me. So when we go after these partnerships, we go after these partnerships knowing already that it's only going to work if the brand partner finds something in it that, that's worth their while. Um, so we don't really go to pitch people like, just let's go pitch 30 people just because we want the money. Yeah. We pitch very small groups that are unique to the idea that we want to put forth. Yeah, because the track record speaks for itself, right? So, I mean, there may be some people who are listening now who are maybe not familiar with the Allen Iverson, Jada Kiss campaign that um, that was ridiculous legendary you had yeah. the, the jay-z and reebok and the 50s 50 cent and reebok too right all yeah. that nah it's a sprite commercial nah sprite commercial and uh 50 cent and reebok the 50 cent jay-z commercial that was hard reebok, that was hard yeah they went um, on tour right after that uh yeah yeah, yeah. rock the mic yep i was there uh yeah which you went to the one that we're at uh it was on jones beach yeah yep jones beach yeah. it was crazy uh <laughs> There's stories, many, many stories. <laughs> um, yeah, Rock the Mic, which Reebok sponsored that tour. McDonald's. Uh, McDonald's. McDonald's. Don't forget that. But we, we, I've been doing this for a very long time yeah. and uh, really understand how to work with brands. So artists that come to United Masters absolutely have a clear disadvantage, um, uh, a clear advantage, rather, in the marketplace because when, you, when it comes to like working with brands, we have... Um, it's part of our DNA. Yeah. Translation is a agency built within United Masters. So, um, you know, if you're a new artist, to your first question, it's not. It's no longer a cottage industry. It's no longer less than. Um, we got, you're about to get into the Apple um, investment in the company. I mean, this is another step forward. And Apple saying, like, we're not going to treat these artists like they're just, it's an option. You can sign on a record company if that's what you choose, or you can go independent. But just because you go independent does not mean you're going to be treated less than and not have opportunities. Yeah. And translation is dope. That's because we have a relationship with United Masters. We've been talking to the team over there and we're doing mm -hmm. some stuff with them. But um, that, in my opinion, is probably even one of the most valuable. How about the name? Oh. Yeah, it's a yeah. good name. That was it before United Masters. <laughs> yeah. I was just saying the name yeah. translation. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, we look at what we're going through right now. I had the name in 2004. Yeah. I was going to translate culture for Fortune 500 companies. I wrote that in 2004. I mean, this is not even a joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been on this shit for a very, very long time. Nah, it, it's it's true. And, uh, you know, when you, you're like, your book is Handling of America. Which 2011. Is, that's 10 years ahead of its time. Yeah. It's not even a, you know, yeah, I don't even know. Like, I just want to come in and just turn this into, like, you know, um, me just like turning the attention to myself but 
I understood very early the importance and the power of African-American culture. I understood it and I put that, I put everything I had on it. So whether it was Jay-Z Reebok and Jada Kiss and Allen Iverson or Chris Brown and Wrigley's and, mm. and, and, and um, uh, making a, what's the song we made? Um, what the, the song we made forever. Oh, yeah, Which yeah, was the Wrigley's yeah, jingle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the Wrigley's jingle. That's that That's was the, the moment I said he's out of here. I, I mean, but, like <laughs> these, did the McDonald's thing too, right? That yeah, we did a uh, Timberlake and Pusher. Well, yeah, but Pusher and Pusher, you know, coming up with the line and working on it. The, like these are all things that was more importantly understanding culture. How to should have a seat at the table, and starting the company in two thousand four and doing all that. And in writing the book, The Tanning of America, I wrote the book so that when people look back on this, they're not going to forget what we did yeah. and the role that we played. And the subtext of Tanning of America is how hip hop culture created the new economy. Yeah. I wrote that in 2011. That's happening right now. Yeah, I remember you said in the book, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the most important thing that ever happened to hip hop was uh, Run from Run DNC putting on those Adidas. Yeah, and people don't. I don't think people really understand the importance to it. But is that the moment when you looked and said, "We're about to change the world"? Well, I was 16, and I knew about the moment when uh, Run held up his Adidas and took them off, and um, 18,000 people held up theirs. So I, I wasn't at that show, but I know what happened, and I spoke to Leo and Russell and Run himself and got their perspectives on it. But I knew when. You can actually use a product and connect it to culture in that way and then get people to buy into it as a result of it, which we've all seen, whether it be Kango hats or um, Rockaway and Sean John or Fat Farm or a Baby Fat. Like, we've seen these things take place. Mm -hmm. But people write it off as, like, um, they don't – back then, they didn't think it, it was real business. It was looked at as some, like – yeah, whatever, 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 whatever. Because it ain't as big as Levi's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever. It's not as big as... But the fact of the matter is, as that culture gets bigger, those things will then get as big as those things. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? It's just, it's just a matter of time. It's, it's, not a, it's just a matter of time. It's not like hip-hop culture was growing exponentially. So those brands that was attached to it would have grown exponentially and have grown exponentially over time. Yeah. And so what I was referring to with the, the um the company inside the company is that I think you're sitting on a gold mine that you f you might not fully even understand the value of it. Because when I was on the phone with United Masters, I let them know my opinion as far as like United Masters, I think is even bigger than just music. Like there's a whole business subculture within our like financial literacy is real big. Right. Yeah. And it's a snowball that's like turned into an avalanche. So when I was telling them, I'm like explaining to him like them, like, the financial literacy people, business people, they're going to become bigger than rappers. The the precedent's kind of already set. Even if you look at like Donald Trump, he's like the first financial rock star. Whether you like him or dislike him, it is what it is. Mark Cuban, the Gary V's of the world. But now our culture is starting to go that route. And it's like a lot of people aren't aware of it. But if you are in the know, you know the cultural influence is bigger than 90% of rappers. 100%. So, so it's like... For now, so it's like for us working with you guys doing a brand deal, if like we do a tour, like if like let's say somebody sponsors that tour, it's the same thing. Then the one hundred percent, and that's just for other industries as well. I, I'm not. I don't even. What, what you're saying is accurate, very very insightful. Um, I'm glad that you said that. The whether it's we don't even have to make the grand statement like it's bigger than rap. All you got to do. The statement truly is, is if you could package information that helps people, that's beneficial, in a way that they can relate to it, that it, they're engaged with, and it feels like um, it's culturally connected to them, you see the adoption of it and you feel that their engagement of it is exactly like if it was a song, mm -hmm. right? So it doesn't make a difference. People want information. They want it packaged in a way that they can relate to. And if you can do that, they'll adapt to it and engage in it just like it's a song. And that's the feeling that you're talking about. Um, look, I'm, I was the behind the scenes guy. I'm the behind the scenes guy. Mm. I mean, I, I've been doing this for 25 years. You ain't gotta, I'm the guy who went to five colleges 
in, in two years and dropped out and, you know, never rapped and really not in music videos. I've maybe been in two in my whole career for a brief moments. But the putting into the game the work that I've had has created me to become this household name amongst people who want the information because I've packaged myself in a way that people are like, I could be like Steve. <clears throat> if I can't rap, but I'm a smart business guy and I want to do deals and I want to hustle and do my thing, you know, I can be like Steve. Someone who I've, who's a very good friend of mine and I've mentored him early in his career is Maverick Carter. Just that's the same thing. Like people look at Maverick Carter like, yo, I can do what Maverick Carter does, you know, because it's a way that you can get it off and be a business person and still be cool and still sit and get in the club and get the right seat and not feel like, and, and that's, that's, that's the cultural phenomenon that we're, we're, we're the evolution of being a business person behind the scenes and having an audience of people who love hip hop, who don't want to be rappers, but they prefer to be financial analysts or in the finance business or it's more know. tangible earners the year is almost halfway over do not miss this opportunity to scale to the next level eyl university is the biggest institution when it comes to business online period we have ramped up things in 2021 with over 20 infinity groups including our breakout crypto club which is fastly becoming one of the top online communities for cryptocurrency information it also includes MG The Mortgage Guy's Home Buyer's Blueprint Volume 1. It also includes monthly financial planning calls with yours truly. It also includes our book club, our movie club, access to our private Facebook group with over 6,000 members, access to over 100 past webinars, and access to weekly webinars from industry experts. All of that and more for a limited offer of 60% off. That's right, 60% off of the annual tuition. Go to EYLUniversity.com right now and become an earner. Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad you said that because when I first heard the name Steve Stout as just being a curious person, I'm like, who is that? I remember Nas had said the commissioner Steve Stout. So it was like, all right, who is this guy? Then you find out who you are and it's like, oh, that, that was the exact thought. I don't have to rap. I don't have to be an a and I could actually do that and actually bring deals to people and like that. That's another way. So it's again, when you see somebody who's doing something that you've never seen before and now it's obtainable. Um, and I'm glad you said earlier that artists need to look at themselves as entrepreneurs because one of the things they, they, they tend to do is just think that music is all that. And I know you should kind of stress having higher margin items. What are some higher margin items mm -hmm. that artists, especially in the, at United Masters, but just in, in general, should be looking to do if they're starting their career because in, in this space we can we find those things right we can have merch we can have courses we get a it's bunch same, of by the way it's the, it's the same thing i mean higher margin items if music is going to be the loss leader which it has become your goal is to use the music to gain attention and then sell higher margin items higher margin than music mm -hmm. in order to, to really cash out one of those higher margin items is clearly shows right you make more money you can make money doing shows more than, than actual um, streams. Other higher margin items are merch. Other high, you know, some higher margin items that are, um, that, that are coming out because of technology, but it requires you owning it. Things like NFT and, and, and how NFTs are affecting uh, the, the owner of, of, of a copyright or a piece of work. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be more down the line uh, but it, it only is going to be beneficiary to the owner. Yeah. So as an artist, you want to release as much work as you can, gain an audience, and then start mining all of the higher margin opportunities that are currently present and the ones that are coming out of technology-based solutions. Yeah. And I'm, that's, I'm glad that's exactly how you answered because as I was thinking, that's something that we spoke about a lot, NFTs. I wonder, what, what do you think the role that that space, because again, it is belongs to the owner, the the effect that it'll have on a United Masters and are you educating the artists who are there now yeah. that this is the way we're going to do a big big gigantic partnership around NFTs and making it turnkey for our artists specifically um, NFTs are the, 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 the terminology and the, and the fanfare around it it's hot right now mm -hmm. um, but, but, but the, the truth of the matter is whatever an NFT is and, 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 and how uh, people are capitalizing on the opportunity right now. The blockchain is going to do exact for ownership 
exactly what internet did for access. The blockchain is going to do for ownership exactly what the internet did for access. If you are the owner of a piece of work, mm-hmm. the blockchain allows you to put a uh, terms and conditions around that work that carries on in perpetuity. Whereas work right now, it's very hard to know who owns it or you know, it gets stolen and copied nonstop without the original owner getting paid. Once you put it on the blockchain, those days is over with. Mm. Um, Technology is going to unlock value for owners exponentially. Um, Just like many things have. We've seen this all the time. Like, you know, back in the day, you know, you were an artist and you put out all this album. And then all of a sudden you die. They put out a CD box set, right? That was a new technology, CDs. Mm -hmm. And then they sold it to you all over again, right? You, You came out in the 60s, 70s. There were no CDs. All of a sudden you die. And there's a CD box set that comes out in 1989, and and everybody buys a CD box set, five CDs packed in one box for forty six dollars, and you're like, oh shit, this is crazy. I got all of Bob Marley's music. That was a new technology, that benefited the original owner. Well, Bob Marley didn't own it, mm. so he wasn't the recipient of that value. But going forward, whatever uh, new technology keeps coming out, if you're the owner. You will benefit from all of Every those time. different variations of, of technologies creating owners for the rightful, creating value rather for the rightful owner. Let me ask you this. Um, shout out to our guy, Talk to Pops. He's a, he has a blog. Uh-huh. He told me this in Atlanta mm-hmm. last year and blew my mind. I had mm-hmm. never heard of this before. He, um, he was like, have you ever heard of this Instagram page called Daquan? I'm like, nah. He was like, you know... Um, they just got acquired for $85 million by Warner. I'm mean, 85 That was a joke. And I researched it, and I saw that they pay The name of the company is actually I Am GM Media, and Daquan is like the number one thing yeah. on their roster. Long story short, it's real. And um, I found out he enlightened me. There's a bunch of pages, like academics and stuff like that, where the record labels are paying. Now they're paying like bloggers and stuff like that um, to promote music. And- they don't do anything. This, this is what I'm trying to say to you about, right? They're paying Daquan, they're paying academics, they're paying this guy, they're paying that guy. And I, get your money. All I'm saying is, what is that? What is proprietary about that that a record company can't, that you can't do? Academics is fantastic. Academics, my man. Academics gets paid by everybody. There's a lot of stuff that academics puts out there that he loves personally. It's just the shit he likes. And there's a lot of stuff out there that people are paying him to promote. And that's what record companies have resorted to. That That's what they've become. Telling an artist, oh, you know, the big thing was we can get you all over radio. Take a hike. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I want to be, that's not what, I mean, it's cool to be on radio. You know, you fall in love with the idea because you grew up on radio. If you are an older artist, you actually, you, you young artists, 15, 16, 17 year old artists are talking about radio. They're like, if I don't get on rap caviar, that's the only, like, that's your job. Get me on rap caviar. Get me on those playlists. I don't care about getting on radio. Like, it's, it's meaningless to them. Yeah. yeah. One of the, the partnerships that you had uh, at Translations was with, was with Disney. Mm-hmm. And so I got a few questions around that because I saw uh, the State Farm ad that you guys did, that yeah. throwback during the, the last dance. And I'm like, ooh, this is great. Hard. It was hard, hard, hard right? I'm hard. like, they did the throwback with perfect. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, was the State Farm deal with ESPN, I mean, it, it kind of all fit together, number one. And number two, uh, you, you spoke about total market solutions and what you're doing to help solve that in that space. Can you, can you speak on that a little bit? It is so refreshing to be on this show, <laughs> to speak to people who actually know what they're talking about. Let <laughs> me just, that's a shout out to black people. Like, it. Like, I, I'm, just, I'm, like, I'm, I'm like feeling a way like, damn, this is great. <laughs> so the partnership with Disney, um, the, the people over there, there's a woman named Rita Ferraro over there. Lisa Valentino, they're just awesome to work with. And Rita and I met and we hit it off 
and uh, Jimmy Patero, who runs ESPN. These are all people that look them up, um, are, are bosses over in the Disney system that I work with. They're going to be mad because they're phone numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I started working with them. And um, the partnership was about how do we take our cultural insight and Disney's canvas, the size of their canvas, and go to brands and provide solutions that are just um, the convergence of culture, technology, and storytelling, mm-hmm. right? How do we do that for, for, for Disney? When we did uh, uh, Save the Last Dance, that was the beginning of that partnership. And um, we were doing it for State Farm, who's a long-term client of ours and has a partnership with buys media with Disney. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, these guys, I mean, we have, I think I have the best creative team in America. I don't even, I, I we've been doing this for a very long time. I've never had a, a creative team this strong or creatives in our company and strategy people this strong. That work came out great and it was surprising to people and it was delightful. And, you know, during the pandemic to have a commercial like that, everybody was, was watching. Part of everybody was locked in. Yeah. Um, but to answer your question, that was part of the partnership. Mm-hmm. Our Now, Disney also has an in-house creative team that worked on it with us. Mm-hmm. Uh, so shout out to them as well. But it's the, it's the, none of this stuff is just us, man. This is all uh, the collaboration of really smart minds, people wanting to work together to provide solutions for partners and brands. And that's what Disney, that's the Disney translation uh, relationship. We also have United Masters mm-hmm. has a partnership with ESPN where we give ESPN hundreds of songs a year for, you know, First Take and all of their their shows yeah. where they use United Masses artists. What I'm finding and what I'm pushing are brands want to be, you want to be on the front end of culture. You want to find what's next. You want to be part of discovery. Then you should fuck with United Masses and all of the artists that we got coming through our system because discovery is being rewarded. Being up on something first, you ever heard of that kid? Da, 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 that has value. Mm-hmm. That has value. Me asking you if you heard a song that you already heard is meaningless. Mm-hmm. Me asking if you heard a song that you never heard before and then playing it for you and it's right it says something. Put you on. And when brands start <laughs> doing that, woo, yeah. woo. Look, I mean, just look what we did for Beats, man. Yeah. We just started working with those guys. That commercial we did for them, Toby's. Doing the vo- voiceover. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> you love black people. Uh, you like black culture, but do you love me? That's a question that everybody wants to know. And we had the audacity to ask it on national television. You love black people. You love black culture, but do you love me? You can't love LeBron and Bubba Wallace and Naomi Osaka and not love the dude that you don't know what he looks like because you don't like the fact that he has a white tee on and braids. Like, and you're scared of that, but yet you want to run up on LeBron for the autograph. Like, that's black culture. It comes in that form, it comes in that form, it comes in that form. You can't just take black culture a la carte, man. Mm. Mm. <laughs> you're like, this is not what we're doing. Yeah, no, that's a fact. So right? That, that, that goes into the part about the total market solutions in it. Because the, the partnership, if I read it right, was a part of it was like, we need to have diversity. And so they kind of brought you out in to help with that. So can you talk about the, the total market solutions a little bit? Well, I'm not anybody's diversity solution. Exactly. All right. So let's knock that off. Yeah. I don't know what they were talking about. <laughs> Whoever said that, that's not what the relationship is. I will help bring culture to anything because I think it does matter. My partnership with Andreessen Horowitz is bringing culture to Andreessen Horowitz. It's like what we what we do really well. It's something I built the business on. Um, it's not driven by diversity. It's driven by good ideas and cultural insights that that matter and resonate. Disney is a huge platform, big company. They wanted some cultural insights in, in, in our creativity. That's what led to that outcome. So can you break down the TikTok deal? Because that was something that um, 
I feel like, once again, you're on the cutting edge of that. I have a son. He's 10. He's on TikTok. And anybody that has children, you know that TikTok is way bigger than Instagram for anybody under, I believe, 24 is the number one social media. Yeah. Snapchat's and, big, bigger than Instagram but for young people, too. Yeah, but TikTok is a, yeah, TikTok TikTok's is, different. It's a TikTok's runaway different. freight train. So yeah. what's, what's the situation that you guys got with TikTok? Well, TikTok, um, yo, what happens is somebody puts up a sound on TikTok, a piece of a song. And really what you want is TikTok to be the place where you promote the song. And then if you can go, you like that? You can listen to the full-length song on Apple Music. You can listen to the full-length song um, on one of these streaming platforms. Mm -hmm. My our partnership with TikTok is that we can take music that essentially starts on TikTok in a short version and then click, uh, that artist can distribute the song or that the full length version of that song through United Masses and get it on the streaming platforms in a very seamless way. One of the artists that did that is artist Carl Roach. He had this, this thing, uh, this song that he put out during the pandemic and he was beating on the table, bored in the house, bored in the house, bored. Bored in the house, bored in the house, bored. He put that out through <laughs> us. So I don't take that, put that out through us. The song went crazy. Then Tiger jumped on the song and all that, whatever, whatever, whatever. This guy, I'm watching HGTV, and he's on there buying his grandmother a house from that thing. Mm -hmm. So he went from TikTok to United Masters, made money, and then bought his grandma a house. And did it all in his house. Yeah. And, and, yeah. <laughs> That's I mean, crazy. He, this, is, this, is, this is the creator economy coming to life. This is the, the revolution of the creator economy. If I asked you... 15 years ago, who's a photographer? It would be the person with the big Leica joint that goes like this, that none of us in this room look like they know how to do. Right? <laughs> and including you may not have done. You know how to do. Right? You know how to do. And then that person is the photographer. As camera equipment has come down in cost and camera quality on a cell phone has become great. If you ask people today who's a photographer, everybody goes like this. Everyone can take a great picture, so much so, there's an Apple campaign that says shot on an iPhone. Mm. Shot by anybody. Shot by this person, shot by the, and the picture looks fantastic, right? That's called the camera equipment coming down in price points, and therefore people can take photos that are good. The businesses that are created off of that are filters that are sold, everything on Snapchat, mm -hmm. all the video business is because cameras got great on phones. That's exactly what's taking place in music. You don't have to go to a studio no more. The cost of recording a song is getting lower and lower and lower to the point where a person could record a song in their house, put it out through a streaming platform, a distributor like us, and then eat off of that song. So if you start asking people today who's a musician, an artist, you have... <laughs> Millions of people raising their hand. If I asked you that question 15 years ago, it'd be the only, the only people that raise their hands are people who had record deals and could afford to go to a studio and make a song. So as, 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 as equipment gets lower in cost, look at this podcast that we're doing. If we didn't have this equipment at this price point, the things that you would have to do to get this show out in the world would have been ridiculous. Now you're going to run up on everybody. You're, and you are. This is the biggest financial show in the world. Fact. And you got a shot because the equipment is so low cost that you got a shot to do this. But if you had to go to CBS or this person or whoever it may be, for them to hear this idea and some white guy sits back and goes, nah, I don't know about that. No. You may change yeah. careers. Yeah. Yeah. But because of the price of this equipment, you're more than making a living. Yeah. That's what technology is doing. It's democratizing these creative industries and giving everybody a shot. Yeah. And also from the marketing standpoint as well, as far as like, you know, we don't have to go to like CNBC. Imagine if we tried to go to CNBC and pitch them on like we're going to blame um, financial literacy with culture and we want to have a like they would probably look at us crazy with no history. But we just go straight and we make our own thing. We promote it on Instagram and now it just glows up. On so the whole, this is what I'm saying. So in music, social media, Instagram and TikTok is mm -hmm. the new MTV. 
Apple Music and Spotify is a new Tower Records and radio. Yeah. And that's called, that's what it is. That's powerful. So, I mean, we said Apple. So let's talk about the most recent thing that's happened uh, in the past few weeks is the $50 million Apple deal. Uh, yeah. So from what I hear, it's, it's to grow technology is what you're speaking about and create more infrastructure. Can you expand upon that a little bit? Yeah, well, we, we've, we, we're building an amazing company and we hired great people. Um, so you know, a great team of people. And over the last five years to build this, we, we definitely had some roller coaster rides. It's very hard to build a new company. Um, when you're trying to build technology and you have an advertising business and you got music distribution and you're preaching about independence and people are trying to hold on to the past and um, hate on you and all that kind of shit, you got to have um, an irrational belief in yourself and irrational persistence to, to fight it. And that paid off. Um, it paid off a few times, but this Apple announcement said a lot. It was loud because... You know, A, Apple doesn't invest in anything. I mean, so when you get Apple behind you, it ain't even about the money. It's about, like, Apple believes in it. That, that's, that means it's bigger than it ain't just some regular shit. Yeah. Number two, um, it validates who we are. And it, it, it says to the independent artist community, you are being heard. You are not a cottage industry. You are not less than to the point that Apple believes in it. Um. And then, you know, for me as a CEO, I look at that like it's AI and Jada Kiss again. It's, it's that type of stuff. You know, it's just, it's what I've been doing. And man, anyone listening to this right now, like you got to be able to run the real marathon. I've been doing this shit. I'm 50. I've been doing this straight up since I was 23 years old. I was 22 years old as Kid and Play's road manager. And if I talk about stuff before that, mm -hmm. that's non-music, it's the same thing I've been doing. I've sold mortgages. I sold mortgages when I was 18 years old in Bedford-Stuyvesant. I did this. So the race you have to run, you better love it because you're going to be running it for a while if you want to, you know, pop this type of shit. <laughs> <laughs> so when, like, when Apple, do they... Do they have like part equity ownership in the, in the company yeah. now? Okay. Yeah, Apple's yeah. a partner in the company. They, okay. they, you know, just the 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 equity holders of my company are myself and the employees of Translation United Masses, Apple, Google, and Andreessen Horowitz. That's oh, it. Google's involved as well. Yeah. Yeah, they were they were original. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so it's in their vested interest to not only like. To make sure the company goes as well because they're part owners of the company as well. Well, you, you know, you put together a board, you run your business, you, you know, you, they're strategic for a reason. Um, I mean, it's not like you can fall backwards and they're going to catch you. You got to do the yeah, work. Yeah, yeah, right? for, yeah. Sure, for sure, for sure. Um, so as far as that going forward, where do you see the future for United Masters? Like, what would your 10-year plan be we have in this conversation 10 years from now, where do you envision United Masters? What's going on, Ernest? Look, at 26, I made one of the most important decisions of my life. That's right. I didn't have family at the time, but I did have a life insurance policy. A wise man told me life insurance isn't about the people who die. It's about the people who live. It's one of the best ways to secure generational wealth for your family's future. And it makes perfect sense why people get life insurance, especially term coverage, which surprisingly is affordable. Why not pay a little bit each month to secure the future of the people you love long term? If you're asking yourself that question, I want you to check out Ladder. Ladder makes it impressively fast and easy to get coverage. You just need a few minutes and a phone or a laptop to apply. Ladder's algorithms work instantly, so you'll know right away if you're approved for coverage. No hidden fees, and you can cancel any time. And since life insurance costs more as you age, now is the time to get started. So check out Ladder today to see if you're instantly approved. Go to ladderlife.com slash EYL. That's L-A-D-D-E-R life.com slash EYL. That's ladderlife.com slash EYL. You know how this works. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Secure your family's future right now. So I do believe that it's going to extend beyond music. Um, I think that the idea of being independent and monetizing uh, directly to your audience is something that's going to become the industry itself. Um, there's a, a company you guys sh should look at called Substack. 
It's doing sub it. Substack? Substack. Substack is basically saying that the journalists are actually bigger than the papers that they write for. Mm. So the journalists now have their own platform that they could actually charge for, to read their stories. So if you, if you like reading that writer, rather than going to the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, why don't you read his, his stories on Substack, right? Because you buy into that writer. So Substack is what's, it, it's the written version of podcasts, mm. right? Where you can buy it a la carte. Um, and these creators are saying, I'd much rather do it on my own than, than write for the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. I don't need their authentic, authentication because I'm already me. I've already built the following. I already built an audience. I don't need them anymore to legitimize me. And therefore, I can charge my uh, audience directly for my work. That's what Joe Button did with his uh, podcast with Patreon, which is dope. This is where this is going. So United Masses, um, as this expands conceptually and becomes the new norm, we're going to be expanding into all of those other areas of expression and creativity. Um, because at our core, and at my firm belief, is that I want the artist and the author to own their works. I don't care if it's art, music, journalism, you go down the line. If you create an expression, it comes out of your brain, it's your IP, you should own it. And you need an easy way to monetize it. And I don't want to do, I want to be best in class. So, you know, I'm not going to, Substack is awesome. So I'm not saying I'm going to just start running into journalism because I just want to do it because they're making money. I want to do it for all of the things that I'm really good at understanding and build a platform for those creators. And that's what we're doing now with music, starting with that. And we're going to continue to on that journey. And I don't know which the next one is and the next one is. Secondarily, brands believe me. And they believe me because I've put my work in and I've delivered results. I've come back good. You put out money, the money's come back good. And I'm taking that equity that I've built with these brands and I'm passing it along mm. and getting the artists included in it so they can partake in it. It's what we just did, yeah, right? Exactly. We're sitting here on this podcast. We meet, we dap it up. We already broke bread yeah, because I see what you guys are doing. I'm looking at the numbers. I'm like, let's get these guys this money. Let me put my... We gotta get <laughs> go Let's get this guy <laughs> from one goat to the next. <laughs> so but we got, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but we gotta, you know, it, it, it's it's really about that type of thing. So if I could bring that value and pass it along to creators such as yourself and the artists, that's how we get the ecosystem going. And by the way, once we get going, there's no turning back because we start believing it. Yeah, you see it, it works. You believe in it. It then it starts sounding crazy when people say things to you. Like, what do you, you want me to do what? <laughs> you want me that's to a sign? fact. That's a fact. Do you know you got talking to him? But that's my whole thing. I feel like with um, music, it's one of these things we, should, we did. Uh, Derek Ferguson, mm -hmm. shout mm -hmm. out to him. And we oh, interviewed God. him. That was a while ago. And we, I, I'm, I'm asking him. Derek like a, Ferguson from Robin Hood used to be at, yeah, 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 yeah. He's the best. Yeah, he yeah, went to church with me. Yeah, that's our guy. That's, uh, so I, he, he was, I went to church with him. In, uh, in Connecticut, up in uh, New Rochelle. New Rochelle. He lives in Connecticut. Yeah. Though. Yeah, yeah. He's amazing. No, he's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's our guy. Yeah, that's, that's our man. Yeah, that's our guy. Yeah, that's our guy. Yeah, you don't have him on this. Yeah, he was gotta... early. We had him two years we ago. We had him two years ago on, okay. on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I asked him because at that time everybody was like, "Masters, own your masters." So I asked him, which was I thought was going to be a very complex answer. I'm like, "Well, how do artists actually own their masters?" Because we was posting about music a lot, and everybody in our comments was like, "Well, how do I own my masters? Teach me how to own my masters." So I asked him, "Like, how do artists?" He's like, "Never give it away." You own it as long as you don't give it don't away. It. Like that's it. Like that's the mm -hmm. that's the easy answer. So I say I have to say, why do artists? Why are they still sign away their masters? Why after all of this, we heard all the stories. We know the hard stuff. Let's 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 go to, a, you know, if you're an artist, you fantasize about your Grammy speech, right? Mm -hmm. And that's embedded in your brain, the Grammy speech. And no matter how fraudulent you know the Grammys is, you still show up, put on your, your Sunday's best and hope that this is the time you don't get jerked. And we see them get jerked over every, and over and over again. Year. And you know what they do? Show up the next year. <laughs> right? Why? 
hope that you it's going abusive relationship type yeah. situation. It's that it's the word um, of people who get kidnapped. They fall in love with their kidnappers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hawk, um, Stockholm syndrome. Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. Artists, you come up. There are certain artists that you know you you want the money, like. You ain't got shit. <laughs> Give me some money, man. Yeah, that's it. Right? Yeah, like, I'll take some money. Like, it's it's all, like, so you you want to fight for the right thing, but you ain't got no money. You got to feed your daughter, whatever. You're going to do that. I mean, there's nothing to say about that, yeah, right? That's what it is. But the question starts to, it's like, if you're a new artist right now, you don't need to do that, right? You can, you can come up because you see it already. And the artists are getting younger and younger and younger, and it's working. And if you're a veteran, an artist who's been doing this for a while and your deal is up, why would you resign and, and not own your masters going forward? That's why, let's give it up to Nasir, because Nasir owns his shit now. You know, it's a shame Nas don't own Illmatic. Mm. But the facts of the matter is Nas owns his work now. He owns King's Disease. Mm -hmm. He owns all of his works going forward. And... um. He's an example of somebody who said, you know what? I'm not going to take the, the short money because it's short money. I'm going to bet on myself and own my shit. And then I found higher margin items like Coinbase. <laughs> <laughs> and ring. <laughs> I am, I said yeah. very high. Yeah. I actually, that leads, me, that, leads mm -hmm. me, that leads me to something. We see a lot of, I know you spend a lot of time in Silicon Valley. Am I saying that right? Silicon or Silicon? Con. Sil con? Yeah. Silicon Valley. Silicon. Silicon. Yeah. I've heard that if you say that. Silicon yeah, yeah. would be the It doesn't make a difference. Uh, yeah. right. The tech people will frown upon yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the tech, the tech snobs will look at us differently. <laughs> um, we see a lot of rappers getting into VC world, mm -hmm. whether it's Chameleon Air, Nas, E40, Snoop, you name it, the whole gambit. Nas has obviously been extremely successful. Jay, don't Jay. Of course, Jay. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts in that? And were you involved in like helping some of these guys, especially Nas, like with your 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 connects to Sil Silicon Valley? I, I mean, I introduced Nas to Andreessen Horowitz. Full stop. I mean, he, he would. I mean, that's. You said I was the plug. You can't. Yeah, he's the plug. He's the plug. <laughs> he's the guy who's like. When I, I never forget. I seen uh, uh, you was at the Golden State uh, Warriors finals game. First of all, you had to, I'll never forget, you had the uh, Shattered Backwards on. Shout out to you for that. I had the what on? Shattered Backwards, the ones. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Shout out to that. And you're looking, and I see Harvest, I see the owner of the Golden State Warriors, I see you, I see Jay, I see Kevin Hart. I'm like, Stout's everywhere. This, this guy's everywhere. Um, so, yeah, you are the plug. We can't take that from him. Yeah. We can't take that from him. But I want to talk about. But well, wait, wait, oh, wait, 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 the reason I think the reason another reason why our platform has become so successful is because for a long time we see our heroes with sports and entertainment and they do these deals, whether it's Jay with Champagne Company, Nas and Coinbase, and it's inspiration, it's motivation. But it's not really helpful to the average person on the it's like they're in the clouds and we're on the ground. What we've done is put a ladder from the clouds to the ground. So when we interview Mark Cuban, I asked him. He has one of the greatest stock deals of all time when he did the short. He shorted yeah. Yahoo. So I asked him. He walked us through how he did it. Da, 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 da. I think that it would be extremely beneficial if all of these gentlemen, they have to start explaining these things because <clears throat> the information is not getting passed down and they're just seeing headlines and it's like, oh, that's dope. But it's not really beneficial. Well, well I, yes. Some of these things are, you think it's self-explanatory because you really did it in slow motion and broad daylight. I mean, Nas met through me, but I manage him and we have a partnership for many years and we're friends. Many, your friend can introduce you to anybody, can introduce you to a Motherfucker who in the drug game will introduce you somebody in the VC game. I mean, he just happens to know somebody introduced him in the VC game. And Nas wrote a check because Nas was interested in uh, Bitcoin. He kept, heard about it and was interested in it. And through that interest, that opportunity came along. And Nas was actually pitched the founder of Coinbase the idea of investing in the company. 
it's it's really not to, hard to explain. I mean, take your money. If you find something you believe in, you could buy a stock in it, right? It doesn't have to start with the VC game, but you could buy a stock in something you believe in, something that you see taken off, like, and and and, and write a small check and and invest in it. Yeah, it's um, not really, a, but it's like even like Kanye, right? Like, it's it's like the whole thing when you go to when you go to like not to cut you off, but like Harvard, right? This is like case studies. They do case studies. This is what we do: case studies, right? It's extremely beneficial. And it's a great way to learn. So I, it's it's extremely beneficial to learn from things that are interesting to you. Most people are attracted to things that they're interested in, which is in our a lot of times sports and entertainment. So we can use these as case studies to study and actually for young entrepreneurs that's coming up. So when we see. It's not, it might not be self-explanatory. It might be self-explanatory to somebody that's actually in it. But you got to remember, like even stocks, we, we, we invest in stocks heavy. But the vast majority of people, a lot of people are still beginning level of stocks. So what I think is self-explanatory for somebody that's just coming up, they have no idea what an ETF is, an index fund. So we got to kind of explain and walk through it. And it's been extremely beneficial and it's helpful. And I feel like <clears throat> we talk about financial literacy and all this stuff. We can never forget that the vast majority of people are financially ignorant. And the only way that they can really learn is if it's actually broke down to them on a very elementary level. And then it's like, okay, that, that explains Listen, it. Listen, and, and that's why you guys are doing a great job. Um, you can't expect Nas and Jay-Z or to, to do that. that no. That's not what they... But, that's but they not could, what they... That's not... But that's really not what they do. They could lead... Everybody has a role to play in the funnel, right? There's the, there's the person who inspires... And there's the person who teaches and there's the person who takes you and makes you go every day so you can get those teachings. And that's how it all works. It doesn't just work where one person solves the entire problem, right? Your, this successful podcast is being able to take information that you, everyone sees in the world that's complex and try your best to make it as understandable as possible. Now, you may not get everybody. There may be somebody listening to your podcast, doing another podcast, breaking down the shit that comes off this podcast. <laughs> Shout out to y'all. <laughs> uh, Troy, what's your question? No, nah, because I, I was going to the NBA thing because on top of United Masters, all, all the things that you're doing, you're also the rebranding the most valuable franchise in the NBA, the New York Knicks. Yeah. And it just hit my mind when I was thinking, I'm like, the brand partnership, and maybe you had something to do with it. I'm sure you did. That Kith, Dipset, collabo to be a part, like promote the Knicks. Is that something that you were part of? And what is the vision and the aspects and the details of rebranding the Knicks? Shout, I mean, out, it was, to, shout out to Jimmy. Shout out to Jim Jones. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was long overdue. We're New Yorkers. I'm not a, a Knicks fan. A lot of the people here are, but the purpose of that and, and the details. And I, I know you brought in Leon Rose in World Wide West. No. I I listen, no, no. Yeah. I, I didn't bring in Leon Rose and okay. Um, you know, my role is on the marketing side, and um, you know, we we've done a, we've done a, we we are just really getting started with the Knicks. You know, we did work for the Brooklyn Nets many years ago, I and mean, we moved the team from Newark to to Brooklyn, and came up with logos and uh, taglines and colorways and things to express what. Brooklyn was. That was translation? Yes. Wow. So the Biggie Night and all that, the Coogee? Hell yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. And um, we wanted to take our talents to a bigger stage. And New York is the biggest stage. Cross the Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah. And cross the Brooklyn Bridge and get to New York. And um, you know, uh, uh, Jim Dolan has been fantastic to me and our company. Um, the team over there has been awesome. And um, whether it's kids... And Dipset and, um, you know, the 75th year of the Knicks and the 75th year of the NBA is next year. Mm -hmm. And the work we got coming out, I mean, we're now going to get started with the Knicks playing this good and what Wes and Leon has done and that and the coach and, and the players. And what they've done is just so amazing um, and inspiring. And now with people coming back to the Garden and the greatest stage in the world, bar, bar none. Madison Square Garden with that team in there. And then, you know, the marketing and the work that we do coming together, I think is going to be when New York basketball is great. LeBron said it the other day. He said it, yeah. 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 The NBA is better, better when the Knicks are good. The NBA is better when the Knicks are good. It's been a long and, time. And, and the Knicks being good and the, and, and the Madison Square Garden and people excited. Manhattan is happy. New York City is a better place. The whole thing. So, um, 
I got a chance to be a part of that. Um, it's one of those things that, you know, when I finally write memoirs and things like that, <laughs> I can talk about all this stuff, the experience. But, you know, it's a privilege. It's a privilege because the New York Knicks and Madison Square Garden is everything. That's, that's everything. That's, New York. that's, that's a, it. That real you, are New York, you are New York City. Yeah. And for me to be able to be a part of that um, and wear this proudly and shit. Are there more sp- sports opportunities that you're looking for? They call no. They call us all the time. I mean, my phone rings all the time. We we don't have time. We work on the NBA. We work on the Knicks um, in Madison Square Garden. And like, we get phone calls from this. Do you want to do that? Rebrand this team, that team. I don't. We don't got time for all that, man. We get we 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 got a lot of, on our plate, man. And one one of the things that's important, not, not to keep repeating the how busy I am is that you don't want to take on something that you can't do your best because you're, everyone's watching you. Mm-hmm. Your reputation is something that you, that never, that, that, that stays with you. People can say a lot of things about me. They can't take away the work that I've done. They can't take away that I deliver. They can't take away that we've built a great company um, that stands for something that's made an impact on culture. And that's going to always go with us. So I don't want to start taking on things that I can't do my best at just because I want to get the bag. And it's not worth risking a reputation for that, mm-hmm. just for some whatever, to feel good about the extra money you got that year when you could actually continue to run. Your life is a marathon. So you got to run the marathon. You can't just be running these sprints. You'll end up fucking the whole thing up. Is there anybody out there that you, you, you think, obviously, you've established yourself as, you know, the GOAT? When what you do, are there any young A and R? Any young people in? <laughs> Go, Goku's got to cut a chunk. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Mike, get on the phone. Yeah, please. that's a fact. Anybody that's coming well, Jerry up, Rice, I, shout shout to Jerry, to Jerry Rice. Jerry Rice. Yeah. They're, they're arguably the greatest of all time when it comes to football. Anybody that's coming up that you think? It's like I mean, you don't think so? You can't argue it. Whoa, whoa, whoa! What just happened? You can't it's argue. Just, no, argue not... arguably. Well, it's football is different because the positions is different. But Tom Brady and Jerry, you don't think arguably he's one of the greatest of all time? Uh, arguably the greatest, uh, greatest player, a player like like NFL a player. greater player than Tom Brady. Well, it's a different position. Or a greater player than Deion Sanders. Well, Deion Sanders, yes. I think so. Where's you know, the Deion Sanders energy drink? Right? No, oh, no, you think Deion's a, a no, greater no, player than Jerry? No, Jerry Rice is better than Deion Sanders. Absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> he's a greater. <laughs> a- no, no, no. Wait, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Absolutely not. A greater athlete. What, but why would, you, why would you say that, though? I'm curious. Because he has every... Because there's, there's stories about... I mean, Deion Sanders was shutting him down. I mean, Deion Sanders year was, was shutting... What year was that? I don't know. The year after... Tell but me, I don't remember. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> no, 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 no,
exactly. I'm here with that. <laughs> um, not. Nah. Okay. No, he's soft. No, no, that's fair. I'm, I'm, I'm going to just say Jerry. Just because, I, I mean, Tom I grew, Brady, I, grew, I think it's hard to say anybody's better than Tom Brady right. because You he, can't say anybody's better than Tom like Brady. He's like LeBron. Yeah. It's well, LeBron. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Listen, let's not do this. Yeah, don't do that. I can tell you. Let's do that. Let's where we go. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> I get your argument. My argument was very simple. That there's wide receivers. There are other wide receivers that are really good. May not be Jerry Rice. Are not Jerry Rice. But let's say they're not far behind. I can't name another cornerback that's even in the class of Deion Sanders. And if you ask cornerbacks, they'll tell you the same thing. We, we can't. This guy is, he he's defines the category. He's the definition of the category. But phenomenon. I, he's a phenomenon. Deion's a, he's a phenomenon. I'm a Cowboy fan too. Let me just say that. Like, <laughs> oh, now it makes sense. Now it makes sense. Come on, you gotta, come okay, on. okay, okay, okay. All right, all right. Like, I'm like, 191 okay. touchdowns. Like, all right. Disclaimer, okay. disclaimer. That makes uh, no sense. Well, let me, let me I ask say you. I Emmitt Smith. I thought that was nice. Is he the best running yeah, back? Yeah, but I, how about this? How far is, how far is Randy Moss really behind Jerry Rice? It's it's far. Not, not far. Not far. Because, far. because. How of, far is Megatron really behind Jerry Rice? He's behind Randy Moss. Megatron. I agree. Okay. And Terrell Owens is there too. Where? No, his thing. His, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Terrell Owens is number three in touchdowns all I know, time. I know, I know, I know, I know. Almost I mean, Terrell, could have been a, a, Terrell, could have been a Super Bowl MVP. Terrell Owens is a beast. These are, all, these are all good conversations. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I wish I had another corner to compare against Dion, but we just don't. I, I guess this generation would be Darrell Rivas. Can I? But can I actually, yeah, I know. Darrell Rivas? Yeah, he was a shot. No, right. I, mean, with, 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 I said this generation. What Randy Moss did to Darrell Rivas with the Patriots. Yeah, that was the, the other yeah. hand never touched the ball. <laughs> Randy special. <laughs> but Randy, he couldn't run routes like Jerry. That's just a fact. He's not running routes like Jerry. That's part of being in that position. Fact, fact, <laughs> fact. That's hard to measure. Who my, my <laughs> football guys? <laughs> Appreciate you <laughs> <What was, laughs> Listen. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> How had, do you measure route running? How do you do that? <laughs> Tell me what you look what, at. What, what's his route? You look at his feet. <laughs> the sure grass. You got to look at the grass. If the grass is cut. That's crazy. He's he he just blowing by people. He said it with a straight face. Because it's the like, truth. Like, no, route running. Route's running. <laughs> is it pause? That's not a pause. Pause for what? Yeah, what route <laughs> running? <laughs> Roddy Lott. Roddy Lott. Ooh, that, but he's not a cornerback. Yeah, he's no. a safety. Safety, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Ronnie Lott. Hear me now. Hear me now. Hear me now. <laughs> what are you looking at? <laughs> Google. <laughs> He's on Yahoo. No, that's, that's, that's a safety. Let, can, I ask yeah. you, can I ask you a hip hop question since, yeah. we're, since we're in this vibe? <laughs> since we're in this uh, vibe. I heard, <laughs> I, I heard you said some way. I'm not sure. Correct me if, if I'm wrong. But you said that the firm would, would have been better than the commission? Absolutely. Can you talk about that? I'm not oh, totally disagreeing yeah. with you. Uh, I'm not totally I'll tell you disagreeing why. With you. I'll tell you why. And if I, anybody I that doesn't know I'm what the tell you why. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I said that. Um, <laughs> Can we preface it first by saying that Nas is yeah, managed yeah, you, by C? You already, you already, right, you already right. did that. Yeah. Um, Foxy Brown, mm -hmm. when she first came out, was a much better, not, forget the word much, was better than Little Kim. <sighs> Little Kim was commissioner? I thought it was Charlie Baltimore. It was Charlie Baltimore. So forget that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay. No. Okay. I'm sorry. It was Junior Kim, Mafia. It was Kim, Kim, Kim was in Junior Mafia. Yeah, yeah. Kim was in Junior Mafia. But little, but Kim got, Kim got, Kim shout got. Out, shout out to Charlie Baltimore. Chad, shout out to. <laughs> I mean, we. we no, guy, You want to make up stuff? No, 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 guy. Uh, uh, Kim, Kim was really good. We, you know, Biggie writing her rhymes and the whole thing. She was great. Foxy delivered those rhymes. Listen to that first album. I mean, she was. Listen to her on, on Touch Me, Tease Me. She came out the gate really, really yeah. good. Yeah. And that, that, was the right, that was the right time. Um, that, that's all I'm saying. The time. Kim got amazing and is an amazing artist. I'm saying at that time, uh, Foxy was just super duper special, right? Yeah. And 
So her, her over Charlie, easy. Yeah, That's yeah. easy. Easy. Her over, her over Charlie, really easy. Um, the, I mean, AZ and Nas making records back then. Classic. Were, were really, was really good. Now, I mean, look, and, and when you look at it in hindsight, Biggie and Jay-Z are just, you know, they were in the commission. I mean, so there was no, there was no stopping what that was going to be. I think what we probably would have had to get to bring in some other people. <laughs> maybe we had to bring in some other, maybe we'd have to bring in some other people, but, but we had, they had, you know, they had track masters. And no, at but, that time, but, but kept- at the time track masters was making every smash. Yeah. Shout out to track. We ran into, uh, to tone. We came up to the United masters office. Yeah. Bro. Phenomenal facility, by the way. Oh yeah, that was that was a minute ago, two years ago. We yeah, ran into Tone. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to them. Um, so Tone and Polk was making the beats, and they were the best in the business at that time. So I just think the production was at a high level, um, and th- th- Tone and Polk and Nas made smashes together. Um, and I just think that you know maybe because of my, you know, my proximity. Uh, to it all at that time that it would have been it would have been better but you know what who knows uh i'm i'm just a i'm just a huge Nas yeah. fan and, and, and i believe him i i, I got and, this question for you let's mm-hmm. see right in this hip hop lane all right because i just read this article i thought it was pretty fascinating i am it's original form mm-hmm. would it have been the best double cd of all time man yes <laughs> yes oh gosh you don't even know bro you don't even know. We, we, yeah, Nas yeah. listened to, we we sat down, and we were we were we were in it. We were we were we were glowing, like we knew exactly what we was going to do. Um, we listened to "Dark Side of the Moon," um, which is a double CD. What's the name of the band? "Dark Side of the Moon." I'll tell you right now. It don't matter. It don't matter. We we don't have to even be worried about it. It's a famous band. This um, this is alcohol. <laughs> uh, uh, Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd. <laughs> now Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. Nas listened to the album, and that album is a double album, and it shows the growth of a of an, an individual. It's like going through life. It's like basically telling an autobiography of your life, uh, an autobiography of yourself. Um, through music. Mm-hmm. So we were doing that with, with I Am. And that's what looking out the belly button window was, him coming through the fetus. If you listen to it, Papa was a player, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. player yeah, was yeah. a Papa, the pretty brown round. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was talking about everything he's seen from the years of coming out the womb to being uh, uh, like a, 10 years old. And that's how he was starting it. So when he went through all those, and that was the hardest stuff to write because he has to like reflect on what it felt like being two years old and five years old and eight years old. And he wrote them. Project Windows, looking, looking at the Project out. Windows. Yeah. So like that, so, so now you're that age, right? Yeah. So now you're like, you come out the thing, you see your dad, he's talking about cigarette burns on the thing, the music he was playing, this, that, and the third, cocaine in the crib. He sees all this shit. Boom, now he's looking out the window. Project Window. He's going on and on. He writes the record. The fucking songs leaked. because, And he just quit because he's such a perfectionist. When the songs leaked, he just scrapped the idea. But had we kept those songs yeah. and then what he was writing, because the, the stuff after that was stuff that was the stuff that you usually hear, yeah. right? 13 yeah. years old, da, 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 da. That stuff was not about to come. And that's, we, we know he know how to write that. Yeah. But when he wrote the beginning stuff, it was just like, nah, it's so crazy. I think uh, rest in oh, peace. Oh shit! Nipsey Hussle, I believe, was working on a documentary on that, and it's so crazy because, like I said, I, my son's name is Nasir, so I'm a huge Nas fan. And um, I remember when that came out. I was in junior high school, and um, when that came out, you know, I remember they were saying like it was platinum in the streets because every we all had it, mm-hmm. and um, it had leaked, and everybody was playing the island, the I am bootleg, and um, okay. the bootleg was crazy, uh-huh. and then. He changed the whole entire album, and he came out with "Hate Me Now," and Funk Flex played it for five well, hours. Well, the, the, no, the, five the, hours. No, well, the the not. I mean, we 
<laughs> I remember that. No, five there's hours. A whole, there's a, no, well, it was, I mean, the, the record, that song was special. Um, and, you know, it started getting fucking thick, man. You know, when, when, when Nas came out with um, the second album with... Um, it was written. It was written. I felt under tremendous pressure. I was 25 years old. I'm helping this man make that album. And, you know, I'm not using a lot of producers that was on that first album. There was no Q-Tip on that album. Yeah, there yeah, was yeah. no Pete Rock. And I'm 25 years old. And I'm a and r and Nas's album. I'm his manager. And um, it's tremendous pressure, <laughs> you know, my career could be over, yeah. but I love him so much. I'll do anything to make sure that he's covered. And we made the record. And the, if you look at it, the beginning of um, I Rule the World, where we use the message, mm -hmm. the, we, we, I did that on, we, well, we did that on purpose because I didn't want people to think like, oh, that's all he had was for the video. This, this, yeah, for the video, mm -hmm. we reminded him. But there were songs that we dropped before then that was like um, where he rapped over different beats. He rapped over um, splitting Phillies, oh, sipping on Bailey's with three Israelis. The, 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 yeah. the commissioner, yes. Steve Style. Yeah. We were doing all that. Just to get it. <laughs> we was doing all that to get it going, and yeah. then we dropped the album. Boom. But now hip hop is growing, and now. The way it worked is, okay, you make the album, now you got to make the next album. But between that album and the next album, Jay's dropping, this is dropping, this yeah. is dropping, this is dropping. And before that I Am album, Jay came after, on his third album and he had Hard Knock Life. <laughs> and yeah, when Hard, Hard Knock Life took off. That was off, a changer. That's a life changer. Yeah, that was that a life changer. Was. Nas had to come back out and we had to find the song. And it was just like, we found Hate Me Now. They hate Me Now. And then, uh, you know, it was just like. I, I always wondered, what, what, like, obviously Nas is your guy, but you also cool with Jay. Mm -hmm. And so is that the time where you, you start seeing that his trajectory and saying, I can help his career as well? Is that how it, it works? Well, there was a period of time where Nas was going through a transition, like we all do um, in our 20s, where You have to make big decisions in life. You got a bunch of your friends you grew up with um, that are holding you back, or you have a bunch of other things in your mind that are holding you back. And you got to decide, are you going to unlock yourself and get the, the full potential? Mm -hmm. uh, are you going to live out your full potential? And Nas was really going through a transition of figuring that out. And I'm a go, 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 go guy. And met Jay, and I didn't think that it was like a problem. And then it became a problem because yeah. of obviously rap beef, but not because of anything other than yeah. Yeah. like, so now I got caught in the, in the middle of what that was. Yeah. But um, the thing that I knew, what I knew uniquely from being mm -hmm. in the position I was in was how much respect they had for one another. I mean, this is, you, you, you're talking about two of the best writers technically ever um, in any art form in the world. Absolutely. I don't look at Nas and Jay-Z and go, Maya Angelou's a better writer than them. Or Shakespeare. Oh, anybody. I don't even think about it. Like, I don't even know what anyone's talking about. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, so the when you're at that level, they know how gifted they are. So, yeah, there's rap beef and there's the propaganda that comes at rapping. Mm -hmm. But then there's the truth. Like, man, you're special, man, and you're special. So I just always believed that it was never going to become anything other than the propaganda that it was. Yeah. Like, it would never felt like Biggie and Pac or anything yeah. that was really going to ever be. It yeah. never felt violent for a second. We had that conversation. You asked me what was my favorite hip-hop moment. Um, and I was like, it was the I Declare concert when I saw, like, two of my... Well, you said, you said, you said... Uh, it you was said, mine. You said the biggest. My, for me. It was seeing those two at the I Declare concert. Jay's like about to declare war and we're like, oh my God, he got another song. And then he comes out and it's Nas. And I'm like, these are my two like idols right here on stage together. This is after all the stuff that transpired. I'm like, that's the greatest thing I've ever seen. Because and it because it was never because of because of respect. You you know, you you could have problems with anybody. And let's in business today, whatever you, if you have if you respect somebody, there may be a disagreement or, or whatever and what have you. But like, if I respect the shit out of you, 
Because I know what you're doing is you're at the highest. I'm not playing with you, man. I know how hard you work. I know I know what this is. If it's some regular ass guy who just ain't looking for the looking for the hype and trying to get wreck off your name, whatever, with that person. But if it's somebody who is your real pair, you don't really want to have that problem because you really have respect for them. So you don't have it in your heart to really have that problem. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you this. Um, who do you, do you have anybody that you, that you eye as like the, not the next Steve Stout, but coming up in the same vein, like a young cat that's out here doing his thing that you kind of see yourself in or you respect their, their grind, their hustle. That's like making some, you know, the move. There, there's here. people, um, Maverick Carter, uh, Anthony Soleil, uh, Nas's current mm-hmm. manager, um, Future the Prince. Mm-hmm. Um, they come off the top of my head. There's, 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 there are a few guys that I, I, I believe, that I see, um, that are really mixing it up. And, and, and Nate Jones, Chris Lyons, over at Andreessen, young African-American kids getting it off. I mean, we're, you could see that if they continue to go, that they're going to get all the way mm-hmm. there. Um You know, I, I, when I, there was no path and no footsteps before me when I came up and what I was doing. So, you know, whether it was creating sneakers or advertising, nobody, there was nobody I could look to and say, could you teach me the advertising business? Could you teach me how to do sneaker deals? No, there was no one to even call. I had to do that from my, my mother's house or wherever, like I was at the time. Um, so it was, it was a different level of pressure and resourcefulness that I have then they probably have to deal with. But then there's things that they have access to at their young age that I didn't have access to um, that gives them a, a an opportunity to even go even further. But coming out of my generation, there's not even a person that is even close. Mm. To, to you? Yeah. No. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. that's why I said like the younger generation. Yeah. But, okay, I but, just thought of something. I'm thinking... I just saw you said Maverick Carter. So <laughs> that's crazy. I did. I just I just did a Jerry Rice moment. I like it. it was like Jerry Rice said, "I'm Jerry Rice." <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking like Maverick Carter because they yeah. just announced that they're going to be doing the remake of House Party. And yeah. I know that was you obviously yeah. managed Kid yeah. Play. But did you bridge that? Or no, I didn't bridge that at all. Okay. No, I had nothing to do with that. Um, <clears throat> how important is it to be diplomatic? And you know, you are in the worlds of music and corporate and, you know, I think it's, what's your advice for entrepreneurs, business people to be diplomatic? Do you think I'm being diplomatic right now? No. Did you, did I give you the vibe that I said something? No, I'm I'm serious. Did you get the vibe that I, he didn't really say what he felt because he was trying to be diplomatic? So you're not, you're not diplomatic. I think if you're honest and you're true to yourself, and people know that and expect that from you, then they want that level of honesty. Um, and I don't think that, that like, you asked me whatever questions you asked me. I, I, didn't, I didn't feel like, let me figure out the way to say this so that nobody's feelings get hurt. Um, That's fair. You know what I'm saying? Like, but, but if you're representing, for, for people who are representing brands and other, like, you have to make sure that when you speak, you're not speaking on their behalf. I'm not sitting here speaking on State Farm's behalf. I'm not sitting here. I'm not saying, and I, cause, and I'm not using them to or, to make myself bigger. Like th- this is you, these are words from me. This is how I feel about that. Jerry Rice, Deion Sanders, <laughs> Little Kim, Charlie Baltimore, whoever it may be. Um, and. No, Charlie Baltimore might be pissed right now. Little Kim's thinking, shit, he thought Foxy, like, because I said that and she wasn't even in the commission. I got that wrong. <laughs> you know, it's like all of those types of things. But um, if you are working on another brand's behalf, then you have to be diplomatic because you're speaking on somebody else's behalf and your personal opinion may not be theirs. So if you're working for somebody and you're representing their brand, you need to be diplomatic because you could lose your gig over it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why it's important what you're doing right now. You don't have to be diplomatic. You you could do this on your own. 
Jamil Hill on ESPN had to be dip- diplomatic. Good. Yeah, that's a right. Fact. So, what's the game you want to play? Yeah. If you can, some people are great at being diplomat. Some people are great at politics. Right. You gentlemen don't look like you're good at politics. <laughs> <laughs> what makes you think that? What gave, what gave, what gave it away? <laughs> Steve, you got any more questions, Sean? Um, no, that's all right. I, no, Steve, man, this has been a pleasure and yeah. an honor, man. Like I said, somebody that we've looked to for inspiration and motivation for a long, long time. time. We followed man. your moves for a long time, ever since now I said the commission of Steve Stout. Your book is on display. Every episode we have, your oh, book Tan America is up there. That's a fact. Man, listen. Anybody who's read the book, The Tanning of America, I have a warm place in my heart for them because I, I put everything I have in that book. I wrote it. Um, I, sometimes I get the book and I just open it up and I read a page and it makes me so proud to know that I didn't cut any corners. That's exactly how I felt. Yeah. Um, and that's how I feel to this day. So thank you for having the book yeah, on you, display. You, you, you changed... <clears throat> you arguably are probably the most important, one of the most important people in hip hop history because there's been a lot of great artists. But what you've done as far as the business and culture and brands, it's like it's, it's just phenomenal. Change the game. So from the business standpoint, we look at that and um, we we hold you in high regard and we hold you with yeah. a deep a deep level of reverence. So <laughs> yeah, when we that. when we came to the United Masters two years ago, they asked us to email them a list of people that we wanted to interview, and um, we put your name like oh, yeah. I mean it like, makes yeah, sense. They're yeah. like. Okay, it might take some time. <laughs> like, we got all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you're running a marathon. I said, look, man, we're running no, a marathon. And, it, and we look, we're right here, right now, and having this great conversation. And, I, and I'm happy to be here. Okay. I didn't come here for no other reason because I wanted to be here. Appreciate it. I'm that. happy to be here. And what you guys are doing is going to change lives as well. Thank you, so brother. So shout out to you. I appreciate it. And this, is, uh, this has been an amazing session. Appreciate um, that. And I'm, I'm, I will definitely come back again if you will have me back. Absolutely. Right? We might have to do something at the, the Brooklyn office. That view is ridiculous. Yeah, it is pretty nice. <laughs> uh, transitioning, coming back to the office. Uh, we open up back again June 28th. Um, oh, your birthday. Uh, no, June 26th. This guy's recon. This guy's FBI, man. <laughs> yeah, this young, this guy's deep yo, recon, you, yo, What are you doing, man? <laughs> yo. Yo, who are you, man? Yo, this, this guy's deep recon, man. Man, this guy's shit, man. <laughs> you are bugging, man. <laughs> Middle name, Timothy. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to be 51 oh, this year, y'all. Oh, shit. Miss <laughs> <Ms>. Cleo. <laughs> Yeah, this guy, man. <laughs> oh, man. All right, brother. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Brother, brother what, brother what, what would you like to tell the people? Um, what was like final words that you'd like to leave the people with? Um, know your value. Don't take any shortcuts. Believe in yourself. Irrational belief. Irrational persistence. Irrational um, attention to detail is what it takes to be successful. There, there is no other version of that. And if you believe that you are, uh, you found something that you love and it makes rational sense, don't listen to what anybody has to say. Because if people tell you, if you have a rational idea that it's not going to work, that means you have a genius idea. There you have it. Yeah. All right. and, and all artists, they can upload their music on United. United Masters, go to download the app, put your music up on United Masters, go to select. Um, own 100%, get 100% of your money, or um, upload your music and and just go through the uh, non-select route, which is 90-10, and you still own your shit. I think that, you know, United Independence is the wave of the future. It's the fastest growing segment of the music industry. And what we're doing is not only noble, um, but we're going to change the music industry forever. Yeah, huge shout out first and foremost to Dave and John and Matt over at United Masters for helping us get this done. Shout out to Nicole at Black Effect and shout out to Charlemagne for help uh, putting the word in for us. So again, shout out to everybody on Patreon.com. Y'all know that's our Proud to Pay program. Our Tier 5 members have access to EYL University, the number one place for business education in the world. Shout out to all our earners. Over 8,000 people getting an education and putting it into action. So shout out to y'all and shout out to everybody that's supporting the merch. Obviously, we greatly appreciate it. It is our time. I told you, our earnest season is coming. Get ready, y'all. Thank you guys for rocking with us. We'll see you next week. Peace. Peace. My graduates from my school being Forbes. Backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs> a mic drop. Backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs>